Good evening and welcome to this evening's Board of Education meeting being held in the Town Hall Chambers. The date is Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. I appreciate if cell phones and other electronic devices can be turned off as this meeting is being recorded. Ellen, would you please do the roll call? Thank you and good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Good evening, Ellen. Here. <laughs> Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Here. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School student representative, Mr. Isaac Santos? Here. All present. Thank you. All right, if we could stand and have Isaac lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. There is no student and staff recognition, correct? Correct. So we'll move on to approval of minutes. Can I get an approval for the January 28th, 2020 so regular moved. Board of Education meeting? So moved. Can I have a second? Second. Any comments or corrections? I have a correction. If we look at page three, it's indicated that Mr. Riley made a change to action item B, and he never made the motion to change it. It was discussed in the minutes pre on the, from the previous meeting, but we never made a motion. So I just need that stricken from the record. Okay. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve the January 30th, 2020 Special Board of Education meeting? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? I have a oh, 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 sorry, oh. sir. Yes, sir. I have a, um, a correction. Yes. I was present at that meeting. Yes, you were. And I'll add your name to it and correct it. I would never, ever miss that budget meeting. <laughs> so great. Doesn't it say here, Cassio arrived at 602? Doesn't it say you arrived at 602? <laughs> January 30th. Mr. Cassio, it says you arrived yeah, at 602. 602? Oh, that's what it says. Oh, I didn't see present. I, I made a mistake. Are you late? Oh, I told you. You have it here. I'm losing my mind. Yeah, so he's all set. Yeah. He's okay. All set. So I'm really sorry. We don't have to change anything. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention. Motion passes. Can I have a motion to approve February 5th, 2020 Special Board of Education meeting? So moved. A second? Second. Any comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention, motion passes, thank you. Public comment, anyone in the public wishing to make comment? You can come to the podium and state your name and address. Seeing none, we'll move on. Communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Uh, just a reminder that there will be no school for students this Friday, February 14th through Tuesday, February 18th for the winter break slash President's Day holiday. Friday the 14th of February will be a professional development day for staff. Uh, I want to give you an update on the web principal search. Uh, the search has been reopened uh, with the posting opening uh, this past Friday afternoon. Uh, this posting will remain open until March 6th. Uh, as Mrs. Schilke will be completing her allotted number of days in March, we're currently working on the transition uh, to another interim who will be able to cover the building for the remainder of the 1920 school year. I'll have additional information out to the web community regarding the interim transition, as well as specifics on the search timeline out uh, to the web community this Friday. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend the first uh, Hanmer Cultural Fair uh, held at the school last Thursday. This event featured countries from all over the world with our own students and families providing the learning experience to peers in the community. So I got to learn to speak a little Vietnamese enjoyed um, some uh, juice from Colombia, uh, a fruit that I had never heard of. <laughs> so I actually drank it, it was good. Uh, but had a great opportunity to speak with, with members of the community and really see the diversity that not only the Hanmer community, but our Weathersfield community is enjoying um, here as we move forward. So it's a great, great experience. 
Um, there are other schools here in town that are doing cultural fairs. You'll see those in uh, your school updates. If you are able to make it, by all means, I highly recommend it. We uh, are monitoring attendance. Obviously, it is flu season. Uh, we've seen an increase in the number of students uh, absent due to illness. Uh, Chloe Bobrowski, who is the district's nurse supervisor, uh, housed over at Webb Elementary School, is collecting data from nurses across the district uh, and is also receiving updates uh, from the Central Connecticut Health District. Uh, I talk with custodi uh, custodial maintenance supervisor Paul Schoening on a daily basis to share data. Uh, Paul has reminded all custodians to regularly wipe down high touch areas such as doorknobs and water fountains. Outside of school hours, he's requesting that custodial staff spray disinfect it and allow it to remain on surfaces instead of wiping it down. This is some process called dwell time. I learn something every day. <laughs> the dwell time uh, increase allows the product to be able to work and fully uh, kill germs. So uh, the custodial staff is definitely on this. Uh, the state obviously is monitoring the coronavirus as well. Um, up on our website, uh, we have a document that we received from the uh, State Department of Education concerning this situation. Um, this information uh, went up on February 6th, um, and we will continue to provide ongoing announcements and information as we receive them. Uh, CLO is obviously keeping in touch with um, uh, information from the Center for Disease Control as well as the Central Connecticut Health District. So. We'll certainly work to be on that. In terms of our number of students, we've seen kind of peaks and valleys. I know at the beginning of last week, um, Webb was really um, increased in terms of the number of student absences. That's backed off a little bit. I've heard that the high school has seen a, a jump uh, in the number of absences as well. So again, if you're sick, one of the tips, if you're not feeling well, by all means, stay home. We want you to be healthy. Uh, with the budget, just to let everyone know, throughout the course of the three prior budget workshops, the administrative team has answered multiple questions concerning the proposed 2021 budget. As you're all aware, the current proposal stood at an increase of 3.66%. This increase was based primarily upon contractual drivers such as salaries and health benefits. While there was not clear consensus at last Wednesday's meeting uh, on where you are looking for us to come in at, the budget increase of 3% was proposed. So at this time, uh, the administrative team is looking at areas in which we can reduce to get down to that 3% mark. Um, the central office uh, administrative team met yesterday. The full administrative team meets tomorrow to discuss um, areas where we can potentially reduce. Um, I want to give you an update with regard to the Highcrest portable bid. Uh, as promised, the Highcrest portable bid is being finalized by the finance department and the project will be going out to bid shortly. Uh, this project is badly needed to address the space issues at Highcrest. Uh, on your calendars, you'll see a uh, Student Programs and Services Committee meeting added for uh, February 26th at 6 p.m. at Stillman. The agenda for this particular meeting will be a focus on the NEASC portrait of a graduate. Uh, this was the work that was presented by WHS teacher leaders Kristen Musinskis and Shannon Belanger. She'll be looking for your input on uh, the portrait of a graduate as part of our NEASC uh, uh, accreditation visit. Uh, all board members are encouraged to attend uh, that committee meeting. They'll certainly be looking for your feedback. And then tomorrow evening, members of the Board of Education, uh, as well as town council and uh, administrative staff will be touring the elementary schools. Uh, we have spent a great deal of time in the planning process for addressing our physical plants. The purpose of the tours is to provide elected officials with a first-hand look at the current condition of our buildings. These tours will begin uh, promptly at 5.30 p.m. at Hanmer School. We will then move from Hanmer to Charles Wright, then off to Emerson Williams, then to Webb, and then to Highcrest. Uh, if you're unable to attend all, it's fine, not a problem. If you're unable to attend, please let me know, and I can certainly get you out uh, to visit the schools at a separate time. So we're looking forward to being out uh, as we continue to move forward, um, hopefully with our phase three of our long-range plan. And with that, that's communications this evening. Thank you. All right, action items. Oh, wait a minute, I have a question, or I have a request. Um, Mr. Emmett, you yes. just said that you would keep the web parents on a timeline for the posting, et cetera, for the new web principal. That's correct. Could you also provide that to the board? Oh, of course, update? absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to action items. Can I get a recommended approval of the contract extension with Access Transportation Solutions? So moved. A second? Second. Any questions? We went over this last time. 
Yes, I'd be happy to, happy to speak to that. Um, we discussed it at, at the last uh, finance uh, committee meeting, and this uh, contract deals with our students with special needs. This is a transportation contract that we've had longstanding um, for our students with special needs, and the idea here of doing this two-year extension is that this contract will then be in a line with the autumn contract, and uh, when autumn contract expires, this contract will expire, then we'll go out to bid, and we feel that we have the ability to potentially save money when we go out as one package as opposed to staggered. Thank you. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Report and discussion items. Presentation of the 2018-2019 Next Generation Accountability Report. Mr. Emmett. Thank you. At this time, Mrs. DeSoli will be coming forward and providing you with a presentation on the recently re uh, released uh, accountability report for the district and for each of our schools. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm um, happy to be here to talk about the Next Generation Accountability Report for uh, the school year 2018-19. So the, ne the Connecticut Next Generation Accountability System was revised about five years ago, ago based upon federal legislation called ESSA, or the Every Student Succeeds Act. The revisions were an improvement in that it allows Connecticut to now use a much broader measurement or measurements um, to look at district and school success. Well, I might argue that this is still a too narrow of a measurement, um, and it's definitely an improvement from the No Child Left Behind era. So along with satisfying federal and state requirements, it tracks progress of our schools in our district over time and allows us to celebrate our successes and reminds us to continue to focus on those areas of growth. It provides transparency to the, to the public across all districts and schools. And the broad measurements provide a narrow focus, uh, I'm sorry, a broad measurements provide, uh, prevent us from having a narrow focus just on language arts and math success, um, but also to look at a larger measure of achievement. So I just wanna remind you uh, that to please remember that it's important not to use these index scores uh, or through what we call like a gotcha tool, um, because there's really a thousand ways to measure school and district success, and you've heard me talk about uh, my photo album analogy. Um, tonight I'm gonna to talk about my medical analogy again. Uh, so I apologize for those of you who heard this analogy more than once. But my doctors can track my health through my blood pressure, uh, my weight, my cholesterol, and maybe my vitamin D level. While these are some ways to look at my health, they're really a narrow measure. Um, and you wanna make sure you look at much broader measures because a lot of uh, medical illnesses would not be diagnosed through those types of measurements. So instead, uh, as a doctor, uh, you, they would use comprehensive measures to look at um, health. So this is also true for district and school leaders. Um, in addition to the scores we're sharing tonight, we also use additional measures um, to really look at the overall health of our school and district. So here are the indicators that you will find on both the district and school reports. You will see that many indicators are broken down into the categories all students and high need students. High need students are identified with a red H. This year the state has added two new indicators. Progress, are, uh, those two new indicators will be in yellow. So there are progress towards English proficiency for literacy and an oral measurement for our English language learners. They have also added science proficiency for all students and for our high need students. <coughs> So just a reminder, our high-need students are identified as students that are from either low-income families, 
our English language learners, or our students with disabilities that um, receive special education services. So the next three slides uh, show you an overview of the um, district report um, and a lot of information divided across three slides. So I'm going to kind of walk you through how we read this uh, indicator by using indicator 1A as an example. So the first column is the index or rate is the district for the district score. Um, the second column is the target. So if a school or district reaches the target, they would get a maximum number of points. So for example, for English language arts performance of all students, we had district index rate of 72.3. The state target is a 75. So as a district, we earned 48.2 points out of 50 maximum points possible. And when you turn that into a percentage column, which is a second last column, um, that's 96.5% of the possible points. And the very last column is an important reference. It's the state average for those indicators. And we should be above the state average in all of those areas. Indicator five through 12 are all high school indicators with the exception of the physical fitness assessment, which is uh, given to students in grade four, six, eight, and 10. Um, and you will see that in Wethersfield, we are above the uh, state average in all areas except physical fitness scores. Um. So one celebration tonight is that as a district, we do not have an achievement gap. This means that the size of our achievement, uh, our achievement between um, non-high need students and high need students is smaller than the state average. So that's a great celebration as a district. Um, and you'll see in the last right hand column that says no for language arts, math, science, and graduation requirements. However, you will see in future slides that we have individual schools that do have identified achievement gaps. Um, and in addition, every school is expected uh, to meet the 95% participation rate standard for all students, both in the all student group and in the high needs group. So you'll see this year that all of our students uh, that tested in both uh, all, th all three areas, language arts, math, and science, and both all students and high needs uh, met this participation rate. So I wanted to channel my inner Matt tonight and do a little bit of a small font slide here. Um, so this slide provides a district overview of three years. Um, the yellow arrows identify a change that is not statistically important. Um, that is less than 1% change from last year. So yellow is within less than 1% of a change. Um, the green arrows represent an area where we saw an increase compared to last year. As a district, we have increased in the following indicators. Uh, math performance of high need students, English language arts growth for all students, math growth, math growth for high need students, Preparation for college and career, uh, both in the percent of courses and the percent taste, uh, passing exams, our four-year graduation rate, and our physical fitness area. In addition, if we look across from uh, 2016 to 17, as compared to the 2018-19 scores, we have seven areas that are higher compared to that three years ago. Um, the red areas indicate areas where we saw a decrease compared to the previous year. Um, and these areas uh, are already integrated within our school improvement planning process um, that you heard about from our elementary, middle, and high school um, uh, leadership teams the last two meetings. And Sally, just to, um, for clarification purposes, we have four areas up there that uh, don't have an arrow. I understand that those are areas that are new. Um, that, are, that have been newly identified in terms of baseline. Can you expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so you'll see that the, those are the areas, uh, science performance uh, for all students, high need students, and then um, proficiency of our English language learners, uh, both literacy and oral are those new areas that were in yellow on the previous slide. Um, so they are the first year that they are reported. Um, so again, a, a larger, broader measure of success by adding those new indicators this year. 
So this is a school-based comparison slide. Um, so we're excited to announce that Hamner School is once again a school of distinction. And congratulations goes out to the staff, students, uh, uh, parents and the entire community for that recognition. Um, they have been identified uh, as a school of distinction for high growth, which means they're in the top 10% in the state of Connecticut for the highest growth. You will see that both Emerson Williams and Silas Dean Middle School increased in their overall accountability index for 2018 and 19. And Emerson Williams School has also moved up to a category two. So congratulations to both those school communities. At a recent budget meeting, I talked about the growing achievement gap in Weathersfield and the need for additional resources. This slide also shows that we have um, more schools with an achievement gap in math, science, and or language arts. So the third from the last column to the right identifies uh, the achievement gap for 2018-19 compared to the previous column uh, of 2017-18. So again, if you remember back to our school improvement planning presentations, um, you, you heard about an emphasis and improvement of tier one instruction. There was also an emphasis on um, helping to support our English language learners, our special education students, and our students that need additional support uh, through SRBI or provided additional interventions. And so some, these are just some of the ways that we target individual needs of students to help reduce that achievement gap. Sally, can I just ask a question on sure. the category at the very end where Hamner got the star? Could you tell us the rubric, or could you get that to us for how those, you know, what's one equal, what is two equal? Yeah, so I can get you that. There is a calculation. It looks a little bit different from middle school, high school, and elementary. Um, on the next slide, one of the things you need to know is that any school that has an achievement gap automatically drops one level. So uh, we have other uh, schools that could be identified a level two school, but because you have an achievement gap, um, that is why many of our schools are level three because of the achievement gap. Um, but I can definitely get that for you. Um, often the areas uh, identified as school of distinction are the top 10%. So um, while Hamner had performed very well the previous year, it was not a school of distinction. Um, because it didn't happen to be in the top 10%, even though the scores were still very high. Um, so uh, another celebration is also the rate of graduation in Weathersfield at Weathersfield High School. Um, and the fact that our high need students also have a very high um, graduation rate at Weathersfield High School. So that's another celebration. So in summary, um, some of the things we do as an administrative team um, and ongoing throughout the year, not just when we get this data, but as we look uh, and continue to look at continuous improvement model, we uh, look through the lens of academics, talent, culture and climate, and operations. And I think if you think about um, even the last few committee meetings, uh, board of education meetings, school improvement plans, um, you can tie a lot of those examples of the work we've been talking about um, through the budget process back to these four areas. So these are some of the areas that we're looking at um, as an administrative team. We also have a small committee that is meeting to discuss district needs based upon uh, this data, um, but also other anecdotal data to really set priorities and bring forth some recommendations for priorities um, and action plans over the next two years based upon this data. So is there any questions that I can answer? Yes, Mr. Lester. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Thank you, Sally, for that presentation. You're Let's welcome. Well done and a lot of interesting stuff. I have two areas I wanted to explore with you. First on page eight, or I mean slide eight as well. Um, one of the red arrows in terms of uh, directionally going in the wrong direction is chronic absenteeism mm -hmm. for high need students. And I wanted to see if you could tell me a little bit more about why it looks like a fairly significant number um, and what we might be doing about that. Yeah, so that's a great uh, observation. So uh, several years ago, uh, we did a lot of work around um, chronic absenteeism, looked at research and the positive um, game engagement activities of our families. Um, because uh, in order to be considered chronically absent, you a student is missing more than 10% of the school day, which would be more than 18 days. Uh, so you think about almost four weeks of school, um, and that really impacts learning. 
Um, one of the things we learned from research is that students in kindergarten or first grade or second grades that don't have good attendance, that pattern uh, is statistically usually stays with them and they um, don't have good attendance up through high school. Um, so in the past, we had done a lot of work around attendance uh, teams, um, using our social, uh, psychologist, social worker, looking at engagement, and really some proactive positive strategies um, to help families and students um, engage in school. Um, so based upon this data, we're gonna re revisit some of that work um, and look at the effectiveness of our attendance teams. Um, and I th we've really turned the dial on that indicator in the past, and it's creeped back up. Um, and so I think we have some success in the past we can reach into and revisit how we look at that time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and you'll okay. keep us posted on it. The second area and the last area, one is on the next page or next slide, number nine. So um, obviously there's a lot of good news on this chart and particularly in Hamner. Um, but I would um, say, and maybe you can tell me a little more uh, about the accountability index there's a pretty significant drop in a few schools from 17, we can go back 16, 17, but uh, fr from the two previous years to last year. And maybe you can tell us some factors why it, those, and I think it's three elementary schools that saw a fairly significant, uh, Charles Wright, yep. Highcrest, and Webb, a fairly significant decline. Uh, maybe some factors and what we might be doing to reverse that decline. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so as we, as I alluded to, we have a committee that's uh, together really looking at the priorities. So um, some of the areas we're looking at is uh, further developing social emotional learning, um, both through the assessment and explicit teaching of social emotional learning. Uh, we have more students coming, uh, not only in Wethersfield, but all, all districts coming with uh, either um, impacts of poverty, impacts of trauma, um, we talked before about a higher transient population. Um, students that switch schools frequently um, often will have gaps, um, need to build relationships with teachers and students. Um, so we uh, have a, a focus and a desire to really improve social emotional learning um, to be able to support our students through strong relationships. Well, I do think we do some of that really well. Um, there's more that we're finding we can and do with that work as a district. So we have a district committee. Um, we also have you heard through our school improvement plans the desire to improve tier one, which make, making sure that our core curriculum in all schools, uh, students have equal access to that and supporting that through professional development. So we will be recommending some um, professional development and collaboration for teachers to improve uh, research-based strategies to make sure students all have um, access to a high quality tier one curriculum. We have a lot of experts in the district, but finding that time for them to collaborate to make those changes in the classroom. Um, so we believe that those will make some changes um, in both our proficiency and our growth scores. So that's helpful. Last, the follow up and last part of that is, th are, are there some best practices at Hamner and Emerson Williams that, and I know that some things are, a lot of things are outside the classroom and the type of environment that the kids come from, but in those two schools that's leading them to, to do well that we could use in the other three schools uh, in yeah. terms of best practices? So I think that that's really what we want to build upon. So I think this is really gives us evidence of some really uh, high quality curriculum, but being able to support that. Um, over the years, we've lost instructional supervisors for literacy and math um, and people that help with articulation and help drive some of those changes in schools. Um, so I think that has been um, set us back a little bit. Um, we rely upon our teacher leaders to do that work, but there's only so many hours in each day to be able to carve that time out. Um, so we want to be able to bring our teachers back um, and share that expertise across schools. We'll also support them in their professional learning uh, so we can you know, model for our students that growth mindset that we want our students to have as we engage in that learning. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, Mr. Cassio. Um, Sally, to go along with that, the questions that Ken just uh, went forward, I think we also have address the participation uh, level. Um, if you look at the participation level, w our percentages are pretty high as yeah. to the um, amount of students that are you know, in performing in these exams. So maybe you can address that, how that was a real factor years ago and to the level of where we are now. 
Yeah, that really is a success and that speaks to um, our students, our staff, but also our greater community. Um, you know, I think this is important data to be able to look at to help improve our, again, our overall health, our schools, our district, not the only data we look at, um, but that's uh, a belief that we can uh, use this information to improve our work and our craft within our school district. Uh, so when, I think it's probably about five years ago, uh, we, uh, we, like many towns, uh, didn't have a high participation rate, um, especially at our high school when they were uh, at that point doing the SBAC assessment, not the SAT at the high school. Um, so our high school, along with many high schools around the state, um, were put into a, a lower category because we didn't hit the mandatory 95% participation rate. Um, so our staff is uh, really dedicated uh, in order to provide a positive testing environment and you know, we have the ability to have students, um, with the exception of the SAT, for students to have gaps and take it over days and do it in a small setting and do it with adults they have trusted relationships with. And it's really about the work we do all the time um, and to do that in an environment that is supportive and, you know, we want our students to do the best but not to get stressed over it and to feel this pressure and how do they do that in an environment that's really supportive of their learning. Um, so yes, I think the high participation rate is really um, a demonstration of the entire community saying, hey, we've got this and we can show our best. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that. And, and the other thing, just a comment um, regarding the uh, categories and the accountability index of achievement. It could be a handful of students that are causing the percentage to go down. It's not like, it, I, I think that that's another factor you know, how right. they skew and do the factoring in of all the different exams. And I think you hit it on uh, regarding the cultural environment, uh, social, emotional, uh, you know, development for a student when they come into the area um, <coughs> and the achievement. And the fact that the participation for these exams are, I think, a, a testament of the good work that we're doing here in Weathersfield that we're not eliminating you know, we're getting as many people in there to be tested. Correct, and I think, you know, one of the things we have to remember is there's a story behind every data set. So, uh, you know, we may have some medically, we do have medically fragile students that have legitimate reasons for missing school. Uh, you know, so there are reasons where we have p uh, students missing school, um, but again, those count towards our chronic absenteeism rate. So, while these uh, are numbers on your page, there is a student and a family behind all of these stories um, that I think it's important we remember. And it's not to say that the, the school is lacking. Mm -hmm. I think that we've learned over the years that all our schools are uh, in good shape. You know, we have a lot of work to do, yeah. but we, we are in good shape. We have a lot to be this proud of. This is just a measurement. I don't mm -hmm. think that it's anything that's gonna cause any alarm. It's just the measurements that we need to go after. Jack? Yes. I just wanna make comment with um, the increase in um, second language children that we have, that also has an impact on our accountability because those children are in the high needs section, but mm -hmm. when it all comes out in the end, they are right in there with every section that we have. So that's something as a teacher, when you're working with students who really aren't understanding you, it's hard then to test them um, to understand how much they've um, understood in what you've taught them. It's a, it's a challenge. Yeah, and I think it's another great example of the story behind, right, these numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, statewide we have an increased number of students that are English language learners, um, therefore they've added that um, indicator. Uh, you know, our addition of um, English uh, TESOL certified teachers over the last three years have been really important, um, and I think it's an important um, data set because we want all our learners to be um, successful and to demonstrate a year or more's worth of growth each year. And so um, really to personalize our instruction and to target our students with special needs, our uh, students from poverty, our English language learners, um, and our advanced students. Um, and students that come in from trauma and students that come with a good day and a bad day, just like all of our adults, um, to be able to help meet those needs and help those students grow both socially, emotionally, physically, and academically um, is what we're charged to do. And, and Sally, to your point, uh, when you're talking about English language learner status, I'm up here and I'm actually looking at ed sites. So, you know, here to talk about the increasing level of diversity within our district. In 2000, 
13, 14. We had a total of 203 English language learners. In 14, 15, it was up to 235. 15, 16, 257. 16, 17, 281. 17, 18, 302. 18, 19, 337. So we have seen an, a, a massive upward trend. And you know, when we talk about providing services, one of the ways we've talked in the past at budget workshops that we've gotten certified ELL teachers by reallocating tutor dollars. So we're seeing an increase in the number of students and we're having to be very uh, creative in how we provide the supports for those students. Yeah, there's some, some predictive um, measures that in roughly seven to nine years, 25% of our population in Wethersfield will uh, have English language learner characteristics um, as they're learning the la new language. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Healy. <coughs> Sally, help me out with this one term that we went over, and I, I wasn't either paying attention, but I'd like to understand your what, what it means in this um, context, which is I think it's on the third page. Um, Part of the system says it allows schools to demonstrate progress on outcome precursors. So I was wondering what that exactly meant. Yep, yeah, that's a great question. We haven't discussed that. Um, so some of the in indicators are, that are measured here um, are selected based upon um, research um, to ensure that um, graduates demonstrate certain characteristics. So uh, if we think back. 10 years ago to No Child Left Behind, what our federal government said is No Child Left Behind in Language Arts and Math. And uh, what some districts did is they got rid of physical education, they got rid of science, they got through the social studies, and uh, they taught language arts and math because they thought that was successful given the, some federal guidance. Um, so these broad measures, um, students that are at school and engaged are more likely to learn. That's an indicator on chronic absenteeism rate that if we look at attendance, that's important uh, pre-outcome to student success. Um, research will tell us uh, reading on grade level at third grade is a great predictor for success. Graduation rates, college and career readiness. Um, so again, looking both at proficiency. And um, you're measuring this through the course of the year as a quote precursor to. Yeah, so I the think. the concept that you just allows you more flexibility to measure these things so that you're making adjustments so that you get to the outcome you want. Right, so within a classroom, they are measuring these throughout the year exactly. Right. And as a district through our assessment calendar, we're measuring them. These are one, uh, so our proficiency and our growth measurements are based upon um, SBACs, Merit Balanced Assessment, or the high school, the SAT. And those are a one snapshot um, a couple days in time. So if a student has, um, well, we have some flexibility in when we schedule, but they might have a death in the family, they might have a divorce, they might have some impact. So again, there are uh, stories behind these students, and so this is a one snapshot, but we triangulate this data or look at data from our STAR assessments, our uh, BASS assessments, our other assessments we give in the district because we want to look at this data ongoing. Um, if I make an analogy to getting on the scale once a year is not so helpful. If I get it on every week, it might help me better. Um, that's analogy of the work we do in the classroom. So really what that's saying, um, Mr. Healy, is that these indicators are important indicators um, for success uh, for district and school. Um, and there's a lot of other indicators that are harder to measure, social emotional learning, um, community engagement, civic engagements, uh, you know, prob things that we have our school improvement plan in addition to these measures are also important for the whole child perspective. Okay, that's good. Um, and then I just have another, I guess it's an observation. Near the end of this presentation, under achievement and graduation rate gaps, you have a bullet here that says, district-wide, Weatherseal does not have, does not have an identified achievement gap. However, a continued focus on further reducing the achievement gap is needed. <laughs> and maybe I'm missing something, but that, Sounds sort of a circular argument there. I, I assume this means something other than what I'm reading about identified achievement gap. We do have identified achievement gaps in our schools. So is it yeah. because we look at that separately as than a, than a district? In other words, the district being a separate entity as opposed to the, is that? Correct. Okay, Correct. that's fine. It just, but if you, you could see why I would, exactly. yeah, you yeah. would read that and you'd yeah. sort of, okay. So I think All we right. can celebrate as a district. As a district, we don't have an identified gap, but yes, uh, individual okay. schools, we have work to do. I'm not trying to be a smart guy. I just got okay. caught. No, I am trying to be a smart guy. I wore that hair. Any other questions? All 
right. Thank you, Mr. Stoli. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stoli. All right, moving on to announcements and information, please check over your packet. If you can't attend a committee meeting, please let the committee chair know. Um, meetings held, special board of education meeting, budget workshop on the 30th of January, Mr. Michaels. Yes, we'll do both of them. All right, two birds with one stone. Correct. Um, <clears throat> we continue the dialogue on our budget as the superintendent mentioned. Um, <clears throat> Certainly an early shout out to the superintendent and Matt and their hard work at answering the pages of questions that we have given to them in the process. I think the process seems to be working well. It's slightly different than it has been in the past with sort of um, backing into the budget, I guess, that way. Is that how you describe it? Sure. Um, so I think it's been helpful to get those questions out early and then get to a sense of where we are before we have a full presentation of the superintendent's budget. No current meetings scheduled for another workshop, but we do anticipate another one before the board gets it fully, correct? Correct. Yes. Thank you. That's it. Meetings held, Mr. Casio facilities and maintenance on February 4th. Absolutely. Uh, you did receive a minutes in your packet. Uh, we had a meeting on Tuesday, February 4th at the Stillman Building. Uh, at the uh, meeting, we basically continued the conversation regarding the scope of the projects for the 10-year plan. Uh, this particular meeting, I felt, was a lot of good information, a lot of excitement, a lot of things that the committee has to review and look at. So we're looking at phase three. And the scope of the project was reviewed. The lengthy discussion regarding phase three occurred. Uh, there were submitted a proposals to provide ongoing meeting and coordination. Um, at this point, the budget hasn't been set. We've asked the uh, individuals from the Lone and McBroom, as well as Collier, to go back and give us an update on our enrollment, as well as uh, an update uh, on the cost for phase three. Um, one of the things that the public needs to understand, our buildings are just not used for school. They're used 24-7. That's something that we all have to recognize. They're recreational community buildings as well as places of uh, learning. So it is an uh, utmost importance that we continue on this road of our 10-year plan. In phase three, uh, with the uh, moving it forward in the budget for next year. The estimated uh, cost is being reviewed, but you can look at approximately $60,000 for phase three. So the next steps are going to be adjust the budget that was presented as well as our enrollment. And the town will also need to review the records and sites of all the elementary schools. The hope of the committee is to go forward with a referendum uh, in the spring of 2021, and uh, we're moving forward. It's excitement, it's something new. Uh, we're trying to be transparent and understanding that it's, uh, we have a fiduciary responsibility, but as well as we have a responsibility to make our uh, community uh, uh, something that we can be proud of, continued. Thank you, Mr. Cassio. Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative on 210, Ms. Granado. Yes, uh, WEC is the Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative and we met on Monday, February 10th. Um, the mission of WEC is that all Weathersfield children, birth through eight, are healthy, developmentally successful learners and connected to the community. Michael Emmett and I were present for this meeting. We heard positive information on grant funding from Kim Bobbin, who is the WEC Collaborative Coordinator. There was also an update on PEP, which is a Yukon program, People Empowering People. This is the fourth class that will be involved in PEP, which gives the town about 40 citizens who are working in a variety of ways in our town as volunteers. We heard of the progress of the United Way grant of $20,000 that will organize a group of messengers who will be schooled in the services and programs that our town offers. 
After training, these messengers will go, be the go-to person for the many different groups in our town. We also learned of a Yukon program for our preschool facilities for their professional development called Learn the Signs and Act Early, which would be fabulous as our philosophy in our school system is for early intervention. And this would be even earlier if it was in preschool. And last, we, learned, we heard from Valerie Rykovsky, who spoke of working to establish a robust Girl Scout organization in our schools. And starting at the age of four, the girls can join and participate after school. And this organization's mission is building girls of courage, confidence, and character who make the world a better place. So for more on any of this, on the Girl Scouts or any WEC opportunities, please go to their website. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Meeting scheduled, we have the Memorial Day Parade meeting on 2-12-20 at 7-15, the Correct Council on 2-19-20 at 11-30 in the morning, and for the first time, Finance and Operations on 2-25-20 at 6 p.m. You know, I just wanted to mention, Chuck, Correct is meeting actually on the 20th, and um, we're meeting at the Legislative Office Building to meet with representatives. Thank you. Okay, for the breakfast. There is no unfinished business, public comment. If you have any comment, please come to the podium, state your name and address. Thank you. Hi, Beth Riley, uh, 12 Hubbard Place. Um, I've been to some of the financial meetings, but not all of the budget meetings. And I just have some general comments. Um, uh, one was, um, I believe the uh, health insurance was looked into for teachers, and I know that can't be opened up uh, as per their contract, but just a little something to note um, for future, um, future teacher contracts is to possibly look into the state health insurance plan. Um, uh, my district switched over to the state plan. It saved our district a ton of money and the teachers like it a lot more. It's not a high deductible. It's, a, it's more of a preventative in nature. So um, I strongly recommend next contract negotiation to look into it. Um, special education, I'm a little worried that our continuum of services isn't commensurate with other districts. I don't know if I'm correct in this, but it sounded like there was a STRIVE program for grades K to three, but I'm not sure what happens after that. Um, I think there was a, a human relations model at the middle school, but I'm just concerned that grades four through six don't seem to have a lot for that high needs population. Um, I just wanna continue to build up the SRBI model. Um, I really think that that would bring your cost down significantly. Um, continue to concentrate on those tier one, tier two intervention strategies because I think that would really help even with your out of district placements if you're catching these kids early enough. Um, so just continue to build a robust SRBI system and then Hold on. Uh, sorry, hold on one second, I'm checking my notes. Um, I guess I'm not, uh, I don't understand looking at uh, lowering the budget right now if historically you go to the town with a budget and they, um, let's say you go to the town with a 4% budget increase and they decrease it to 3.5. I'm not sure why we're going to 3.0 right now. I don't understand the logic behind that. Because if you go to the town with a 3.0, they're gonna come back to a 2.5 or lower. So I don't understand why, I understand ha like having a hierarchy of what you think you might get rid of, but I guess I don't understand doing that at this point in time. I think that kind of sets you up for something negative, so thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to board comment. Any board members wish to make comment? Mr. Cassio. 
Thank you. Um, one of the comments I just wanted to continue, I forgot. Um, the estimated cost I mentioned for phase three is approximately 60,000. This will be, uh, need to be discussed with the town manager as well as town council. Um, the town council members have been coming to our budget meetings. It's been discussed at that point. And uh, once we find out that there is uh, some progress and that this amount can be placed into the budget for the town, uh, we will be more than happy uh, in, uh, in moving forward with this project because it's not budgeted in the board's budget. It's a town project. Anyone else? Mr. Go ahead. Scott? Oh, go she's ahead, passing Adam. on to Mr. Michaels. Um, I just wanted to publicly thank the um, <clears throat> interview team for the web principal search. Um, a lot of different people gave of their time, and while we have certainly a system in place for how we do principal searches, it, it was nice to hear. You know, we made a slight adjustment midway through with inviting the web parents to continue on in the process um, more than just that first phase. Um, so I think that's a, a good thing. It, it shows that we're listening and our, you know, our parents are an important part of, of that search and it was good. I was glad that we were able to continue on. And while it is disappointing that we didn't have the right fit, um, we're not really looking for the right fit. We're looking for the best fit. Um, so that will come a little bit later. Thank you. Ms. Granada. All right. I attended the uh, Hunger Action Committee on Friday, February 7th. It's not a board committee, but it's an important group that we work with because of its value in providing information about the food insecurity in our school system. In other words, our kids who are hungry. The group is working on a grant proposal from the Food Share Partnership Program to pilot a one-on-one -on -one job seeking assistance program in partnership with the Keene Foundation and possibly the library. The vision of this is a community-wide effort to promote the accessibility of employment-seeking skills for uh, residents in need. We also discussed the success of the Dazzling Dozen, which is a monthly food drive by various town businesses and organizations. Wethersfield Public School is working to designate the month of May as their month of the school system's hunger drive. This was suggested by a local Girl Scouts group at one of our board meetings, and I know Michael will be working with them to work on their request for a change. So great, great job, ladies. Um, and tonight, for my closing remarks, I'd like to voice a hope. I hope that Wethersfield citizens will bring their voices to the Board of Ed and to the town council meetings in the coming weeks so that their priorities and concerns will be heard loud and strong as our town's budget is being developed. And why do I harbor that hope? Is because I am concerned about the course of action that may be proposed in arriving at a budget that will satisfy the promise to cut taxes. Now there's nothing wrong with cutting taxes. I, I mean, I agree when there are opportunities to cut them without incurring the cost of hurting our town. In this case, there is a possibility of a proposal to cut the school budget, and quite dramatically. The Board of Ed has been committed to a strategic plan, which was developed to ensure our graduates are capable of 21st century skills and working in 21st century facilities where teachers and students can achieve their goals. I've always believed that the value of our town, even the value of our own personal properties, lies in the quality of our school system. So in order to know that you share those priorities, the Board of Ed and the Town Council must hear from you before a budget is cast in stone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? <coughs> Isaac. Uh, good evening, Board members. Uh, here is my school update since I haven't been here for couple meetings. In the academic part of the school, we have entered second semester. For the class of 2020, uh, this will be the last and final semester in the Weathersfield Public School System. Uh, WHS have been, has been very busy these past couple weeks. In athletics, boys basketball has a record of seven and nine, <coughs> while girls basketball's record is 13 and four, winning against our school rival Newington and having a game tonight at Hartford against 
uh, Buckley. Uh, boys hockey teams are also doing very well with their record being 12 and 2. Lastly, as you all are as you are all aware, one of Weatherfield's teachers, Mr. Andrew Nicholas, passed away. Mr. Nick, as he was known by his students, was an amazing and caring teacher. I unfortunately never had the privilege of having him as a teacher, but I was fortunate enough to have a bond with him. Mr. Nick would always ask how I was and how my weekend was. His door was always open to talk regardless of the reason. Mr. Nick is someone who you who always cared about his students before himself. Mr. Dinklis will never be forgotten at WHS. At WHS. <coughs> In response to this, I, alongside the Vice President, Secretary, Treasurer, and Class Advisor of the Class of 2020, will be, de will be dedicating the yearly traditional senior gift in honor of Mr. Andrew Nicholas. That is all. Great, thank you. Any other comments? I'll make one. On, uh, I just want to thank the South State Middle School PAC Committee. On January 31st, we had a spirited um, dodgeball tournament that I participated in, and I learned that I am not young anymore and I should stick to golf. But it was fun. There was 26 teams, and they played to a championship. So it was a lot of fun and a great event to, to participate in and go watch. Seeing no other board comments, can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion passes. Thank you.